about her, I've listened to some of her messages, and I'm sure she's not a stranger to most of you uh, who will be here today. Um, Dr. Eunice Adubango is a mother to three boys. She's a wife uh, to Brand Adubango, and I hope I'm pronouncing this name right, Eunice. Um, yes, you are. She's a trained civil engineer with a doctor. Thank you. She is a trained civil engineer with a doctorate in civil engineering project management. Uh, she served as a lecturer at Makere University for 13 years and is currently uh, lecturing at Ndeje University School of Graduate Engineering Studies. Her life purpose, and she stressed her passion as well, is to mentor women and young people, which she does under her several brands. Uh, you've heard of Uni's Kitchen, Uni's Culinary Institute, and Talitha Kitchenware Store. She is also a gifted writer and has authored four books, including a yearly women's devotional titled Relentless, In Relentless Pursuit. An amazing devotional, by the way. Um, at the end of the, I've read one of them, and usually there's a, a menu for one, there's a recipe for one of her, her meals that's, that's quite interesting. Treated this devotional as and that's in, in circulation. Uh, Dr. Eunice is doing it all, as you will have noticed, okay? She's an author, a gifted author. She's a restaurant, she's a businesswoman, and she's doing all this while thriving. So it's our privilege to have her speak to us this morning. I am personally excited about the next 45 minutes um, as she shares with us on the topic of faith-driven entrepreneurs. We've had this topic, we've had uh, aspects of this topic being discussed in various different sessions of the series that we've had, and it will be wonderful to hear from her. So I'd like to encourage you all to have your pens and paper ready. And also as she goes along to share with us, please remember to note down um, your questions in the chat room. We will have an opportunity to raise our hands um, so that we can be able to ask questions direct when we wish to. So in order to redeem time, please do allow me to uh, welcome Dr. Eunice this morning. And uh, right now I hand over to you, Doctor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very happy to be here this morning. I communicated with Doreen and also with uh, Josephine that about uh, 15 minutes to the start of this session, my laptop just froze. It's, it's just one of those things that <laughs> you, just, you just wonder. Everything was working well. I tested everything, tested my slides, and then just at the point when now I wanted to just join in, the laptop just froze. But I have peace. Interestingly, at the point when my laptop froze, the scripture that came to me is the scripture that I have put on my WhatsApp, my WhatsApp status this morning. And it says, go up with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills will be singing and they'll be clapping their hands. And so I just started to sing a song that I think was by Maranatha uh, when I was little that says, go up with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills will be joyfully singing and all the plains and the hills will clap their hands. And I have so much peace. I cannot explain it. I can't, um, I really wanted to share my slides. I can't share the slides. And so I, I have had to use my phone. So at some point I'm going to have to switch off the video because you, the, the, the troubles of holding it and yet talking and everything, but I'm happy. And I know that the Lord is going to use me in this session, but I also know that the Lord is going to speak to you. In the name of Jesus, I know that we have already prayed, but I pray that this session will not be one of those that that you attend and you are the same. I pray that like one of the things that I'm going to share here this morning, one of the turning points in my life that happened at this altar of intercessors for Uganda, actually through intercessors for Africa, I pray that just like something happened about eight years ago that flipped me and changed me and made me start to live the entrepreneurial life as a believer, I pray that it shall happen to you this morning in Jesus' name and everybody said, 
Amen and amen. 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 So, amen. I was given a number of topics to choose from, and um, for some reason, all the topics that I chose that I was choosing, uh, Josephine would tell me that someone has already covered them, or someone was uh, in the process of covering them, and so I chose to uh, share about the faith-driven entrepreneur. Um, and business person. And I remember she still told me someone had shared, but I just had a tagging on my heart. I just had, um, I just knew that this is what I, I, I needed to share about. So even when she told me someone had shared, I said, no, this time around, I'm going to share about this. And uh, the first thing that I, I thought about when I was um, looking at this topic was the word drive, to be driven. And I, I, I first went to the dictionary to, you know, our normal English dictionary. And it says to be driven is to be operated, to be moved or controlled by a specified person or source of power. Now, for me, when I, when I read it from the dictionary, I looked at the word specified person. And in this case, I underlined it and I said, if it is a matter of faith, then the specified person is God. And then all source of power. Wow. When I read that, I thought about 1 Corinthians 4.20. And it says that the kingdom of God is not just a matter of talk, okay? But it is of power. It is of dunamis. It is of the enablement that is supernatural. It is about that that raised Christ from the dead. The kingdom of God is not just something that looks like a world rulership, but it is of raising dead things and it is of causing dead things come to life. So I thought, okay, so if we are talk to, talking about being dri having a faith-driven entrepreneur, we are talking about someone whose operations, whose movements, and who, whose controllership is by a specified person who is God and is out of a certain source of power, which is the power that raised Christ from the dead, the power that causes even the stupid and the lowly things of this world to become bigger and to become better. Now, other words that you can use to um, describe the, the word power, and I got this from the, the concordance, from the Bible dictionary. When I read the scripture in 1 Corinthians 4.20, I, I had to underline that word power and then I started to ask myself, what's the meaning of power? When the Bible says that it is not mere talk, but of power. And the Bible dictionary describes power as a force. The Bible dictionary describes power as ability. The Bible dictionary says power also means abundance. It means strength and it means might. So we could as well um, describe, or we could as well say that the definition of the word driven from the dictionary means to be operated, moved and controlled by God, okay? And or by force, by a force, by ability, the ability of God, by the abundance of God, by the strength of God and by the might of God. Now, that just flips everything and it just makes the biggest difference. Because as a faith-based entrepreneur, I need to come to a place where I understand that I am driven by the ability of God. I am driven by the abundance of God. I am driven by the strength of God. I am driven by the might of God. That even when I'm like Gideon and I'm in that valley and I have, have hidden myself in there and I am threshing wheat under fear, God comes to me and says, you are a mighty woman of valor because my faith in God connects me to the portal of power. It connects me to the portal of ability and of abundance. Now, another dictionary, another um, explanation in the English dictionary for driven is relentlessly compelled by a need to accomplish a goal. Now, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14 to 15, that Christ's power compels us. So you are not going to be driven by faith. We are not even talking about faith yet, unless Christ's love has been shed abroad in your heart. And it is out of that love that you are driven, that you are compelled Okay, you are relentlessly driven by a need to accomplish a goal. Now, for us as believers, what is our goal? 
Genesis 1, 27 to 28, the Bible says, God made them male and female. He placed them on the surface of the earth. And then he gave them a goal. He gave them a mandate. And he said, be fruitful, multiply, subdue the earth. Therefore, as a faith-based entrepreneur, if I don't yet understand that my goal is fruitfulness, my goal is multiplication, if I don't understand that, I'm going to have one small shop. I'm going to keep eating up the capital so it never becomes bigger. I'm going to uh, fear to acquire property. I'm going to, uh, fear to, I'm going to fear to set up in the next town. I'm going to fear many things because I don't inherently understand the goal because it is the goal that actually makes you to be pushed according to the English, English dictionary. Now, there is another bit about the goal that we all need to understand. Matthew 6, 10, the Bible says, in, when, when, when Jesus was teaching us how to pray, he told us to pray, thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So as a faith-based business person, I need to understand that the goal is to establish the kingdom of God. Now, when I understand that, there are certain decisions that I make because that goal keeps pushing me. Because I understand that I am here on a conquest. I'm here on a mission to conquer. I am here on a mission to be fruitful. I am here on a mission to multiply. I am here on a mission to subdue. Now, to subdue means to put something under your rulership, to put something under your force, to put something under the tenets that govern your kingdom. So it also means that we need to study the kingdom first. And then we need to understand why this kingdom is here. And then we need to understand what our mandate is in this kingdom. And that fire, children of God, when you start to get a hold of that fire, you are not going to do business as usual. You are not going to be like that believer who gets capital for 500 poultry. And then when, they, when, when the poultry is sold, they eat up everything. They do not multiply it. They do not understand. They go back to the place of prayer and ask for more, ask for more, ask for more. It's because they've not yet gotten in touch with the force that compels them. Now, another definition is to be very hardworking and ambitious. That is to be driven. Now, here in our topic, we are saying that it is our faith that causes us to be hardworking and ambitious. There are so many unambitious believers. Actually, ambition makes them feel bad. Ambition makes them criticize the other person. Ambition makes them think that the other person is sinning. But the thing is, they've not yet understood the love of Christ. They've not yet understood why Jesus left heaven. I mean, a man leaves his father's house. He's the only begotten son of his father. He leaves his father's place where there is everything and comes down to you and gets familiar with your circumstances. And he gives you everything you need. And then he says, and he saves you from eternal damnation. And he brings you into a kingdom where you previously were not. And then he says that the only thing I want you to do for me, and I'm going to be in charge of this to the very end, but the only thing I want you to do for me is to occupy this space where I have been until I come back. And he has given you a very beautiful promise for when he comes back. And you cannot fault him. You can't say he's a liar because you have already seen him fulfill certain things. And yet you sit back and you do nothing. The other definition for to be driven is to be forced to come or to go in a particular direction. <laughs> John 21, 18 says that when we were little, we did not, we, 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 we complained about where we need to go, how we need to be pushed and, you know, things like that. But when we mature, the Bible says it is maturity in the faith that is going to cause you to be driven from any one side to the other. It is maturity. When your faith matures is when you'll get to that place where God puts something in your heart that is so big. And you say, yes, Lord, I will do it. 
I'm going to forego everything and I'm going to do it. It is maturity of faith. Now, I want to, um, I'm, I'm going to switch off my video, like I said, because, uh, you know, holding the phone and everything, and then I'll be able to, to take us through a few things and then um, we'll get to the questions and answer. Okay, so moving on, we have talked about what to be driven means, okay? And I hope that even as we talked about that, in your heart, in your mind, you started to ask yourself, am I really driven? You know, most of us think that because we say I do to the gospel, because we say I do to Christ, it therefore means we are mature, it therefore means we understand, it therefore means that God is working in our lives, and it is not necessarily true. Now, if we are going to move towards being compelled by our faith, what are we going to do? There are just three things I want to share this morning. It's a wide topic. I would share many things, but let me share three. Number one, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, that we, as we behold him, even with unveiled faces, we contemplate his glory and we are transformed into his ever increase you know we are transformed into his image and we experience ever increasing glory as we are moved from one level of glory to the next by the spirit of god now i want to share with you some short stories about my personal life to explain this scripture and what i mean by you in order for you to move towards compulsion, you need to consider 2 Corinthians 3.18. There are four things that are very important in that verse. Number one, you need to get to a place where you behold him with an unveiled face. Unveiled. Okay? Unveiled face. Now, man, many of us, our faces are veiled with... Um, the man of God, what the man of God said, what the man of God will do, what, uh, you know, we, we, we focus on who called for the prayer meeting than the one we are going to pray to. We focus on that, that, that one sentence that the person said that seems brilliant than on the word of God. We focus on our failures than on the power and the might of God. Remember, in our definition of being driven, we said that the word power means ability, means abundance, means strength, and means might. And those things have been given to every believer, whether they are in the south of the Sahara or they are in East Africa, whether they are in Uganda or they are in Tanzania, whether they are in China or they are in Singapore that we like to talk about as a very good economy, whether they are in Australia, wherever they are, they can connect to the abundance of God. Now, if you do not get to a place where your face is unveiled and you see the truth that it doesn't matter if you are in Uganda and it doesn't matter if you are in Kololo or in Chitago, where I'm speaking right now, if you connect with where you are seated, that is in the heavenly places, you are not going to be compelled because every other time, you are going to focus on the things that are not true. You are going to, you know, to constantly focus on the things that are not right in your life. You're going to constantly focus on the, the areas of your inadequacy, but you need to get an unveiled face. Now, for me, this was my unveiled face experience. I, was, uh, I, I got born again at 10. And I have been, I've not been those passive believers. I keep telling people that for me, when I got born again, I immediately went to the front bench. When I was younger, people used to actually think, because I used to sing in a worship team in the, in the Mokono Cathedral, and 95% of my colleagues were children of reverends. Many people used to think that actually my father was a reverend. And I have a friend who used to tease me and say that I looked like I was born under the altar. So I, for, be, for knowing God, I knew God. For, for knowing prayer meetings, I knew how they go. When a certain word was said during a meeting, I knew where we were heading. I knew, I knew, I knew that when a certain song is sung, you do a certain thing. I knew when to kneel. I knew when to stand. I knew when to go in. I knew when to go out. I knew when to shout my hallelujah. I knew when to keep quiet. I even knew that if I'm in an Anglican congregation, I need to behave like this. If I go to a Pentecostal, I need to behave like this. I knew that if I needed to dress, maybe let me dress like this. If I go to this congregation, I sort of knew my way around. 
But then the other thing about me is I have always been a person of prayer. I started to do personal retreats when I was a child, when I was 30, uh, no, not 13, in senior three, that was about 15. I started to go away uh, for a whole day. I would wake up in the morning at my parents' house, clean, whatever, and then I would move up to Bessania Hill and sit there alone. I didn't even understand some of the things that I was doing, but I was doing them, and yet my face was not unveiled. And yet I still be, uh, lived like a normal believer. Got married. I mean, I, I crammed the Psalms. I'm a songwriter. I wrote so many uh, songs out of the Psalms. I danced for the Lord. I served. I did all sorts of things. Okay. And I also uh, remember that um, when I was... Um, when I was at the university, I started to go for these other retreats, Gerenga, so many things. My face was still veiled. I just had not met God face to face. And then one time I, 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 I'm struggling. I had at that point, I think I had done 10 businesses and they had failed. And uh, mm -hmm. Auntie Speciosa Mutiaba uh, invited me for a meeting of Africa House of Prayer. I knew how prayer meetings go, and I had always called myself a person of prayer, so I wasn't sure if this was going to help anyway. But I had tried so many things, I could as well have tried another thing. So I accepted to go for that meeting. It was in Entebbe at the Imperial uh, Botanical Beach Hotel. So I go. In fact, I didn't believe so much in the meeting that I was. we were told to register with $150 for the five days. But I agreed with my husband that we would pay only for day one. We even talked to Aunt Speciosa. We said we'll pay only for day one. And then if we think we like it, we'll pay for the other days. Well, I get into the meeting and within the first 15 minutes, I am sure that I'm going to want to do this for the five days. So I get out of the room. We, we were living from hand to mouth. We were quite broke. We had very little. But I just had an inner witness that I needed to be in this place. So we pay, and that starts my journey. Now, what is the thing that ticked me off? In there, I met a, a group of people. Number one, I went on my jean trousers, my spaghetti top. I mean, I, I just showed up. And the first thing that shocked me was how people were dressed for doing business with God. And you're probably there and you're asking, what, what is that to do with my faith-based entrepreneurship? You see, until you get to that place where your absolute honor is to God and not to man. You see, you can show up in the presence of God in any way you want to, but you can't show up in the presence of man anyway then you know that your face has not yet been unveiled. I saw people, I mean, people were on suits. And I remember the first word that struck me, one of the leaders, the continental leaders said that we have come to do business with God. I had never thought prayer means doing business with God. I thought prayer is asking God. So what is this you're talking about? Then he mentioned something in that meeting that, that I, I, I chewed on for the rest of the week. He was talking about Moses and the training Moses went through. And he said that Moses, that, that, that the reason why Moses had been taken to Egypt as a child and taken into Pharaoh's house is that God had a plan to rescue the Israelites, but he needed someone who understood the laws of Egypt. And so he needed to send Moses into the, the highest Egyptian household so that he can be trained by the highest and the best. And he mentioned this. He said, I believe Moses probably went to the University of Memphis. And he said, and he laughed and he said, I say University of Memphis because that is the best university in Egypt. And which is the better place to take someone who is Pharaoh's child than that university? And I remember looking at this gentleman and thinking, where on earth do you get these things from? I mean, I've read that scripture all my life and all I know is Moses in a basket. What are you talking about? I'm thinking, Moses was just in a basket as a child. And here you are, and you're connecting it to the best university. You're connecting it to law. And actually, he said, Moses must have done 
law. He must have studied law because in order for him to stand in front of Pharaoh and negotiate on behalf of the children of Israel, he had to be someone who understands the law of Egypt. And I was like, you know something, Eunice? You need to get to a place where scripture comes this alive. Until that happens, forget about this whole business of excelling in this world. Because until that time, I never saw myself in the word. I crammed it. I used it. I, I, I repeated it. I regurgitated it. But for me to get into it and start to walk on the streets of Egypt like this, for me to get into Pharaoh's house and eat food at his table, for me to get into Moses' bedroom and look at his robes, it had never happened to me. And so that for me was the start of my unveiling. What do I mean? I came to a place of self-awareness where I, had, I realized that even my prayers were a form of cram work. I realized that I was just repeating. I mean, listen to a normal believer's prayer. Mighty Lord God of Father, we thank you, Lord God of Father, because Lord God of Father, you are Lord God of Father. Hallelujah, Lord God of Father. And I'm thinking, what have we just said in that many sentences? We've just said, mighty Lord God of Father, we thank you because you're good. That is actually really what we said. But they have listened to someone do that all the time. They say it without thinking. And therefore, it is of no effect to them. That is what the scripture means when it says a form of godliness, but no power therein, no ability therein, no enablement therein. For me, I got to that place where I realized, you know something, Eunice? You need to get to a place of real prayer. And real prayer is not how many demons you cast out. Real prayer is not how high your voice is. Real prayer is a place where you totally connect with God. Real seeking is a place where you walk through those scriptures and they become a part of you. For me, that is the place of my unveiling. I don't know what yours will be, but that was the first place. Of course, I have gotten so many other times of unveiling where I sit in a place and I realize, mm, Eunice, you've not yet done this. Eunice, you've not yet understood this. I have had to move away from, I mean, I even got to a place where I understood what the scriptures means by working out my own salvation with fear and trembling. And so as a result, I started to walk towards contemplating his glory. Now, I want us to think about David, okay? I want us to think about David. The scriptures tell us that when David was going to slay Goliath, he said certain words. What did he say? I mean, those who can find the scriptures, because I'm in a hurry, when you find the scriptures, you can share them on the chat. David said that, that, you know, as he's in the crowd and Saul is asking him, you are youth, you are tiny, how are you going to pull down this guy? The same things we are asked in this economy, you're in Uganda, how are you going to prosper, the political parties and everything. David had gone to a place where he contemplated the glory of God. What shows me in scripture? The Bible says that number one, David so, told Saul, he said that from, from my youth, he's, he's still a youth, but he's saying from my youth, he said, I have been taking care of my father's heart. And when a bear attacked the heart, I, I, I killed it with my bare hands. When a lion came to attack the herd, I killed it with my bare hands. And then he told Saul, he said, this Philistine will be just like one of those bears. Children of God, this economy is just like one of the bears that you have been able to slay in the secret place. If you can dislodge powers of darkness, the key word is powers and darkness. Why can't you dislodge what you can see? You've got to get to the place where you contemplate the glory of God. So David said that, I mean, he, 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 he looked and he said, e, I have been able to kill so many things with bare hands. Here I am, you're even giving me a sword. I mean, David contemplated and he said, man, 
I have been able to kill without a sword. You're telling me that when you give me that thing I have always hoped I could hold, eh? you are telling me I can't kill this guy? That is number one. Number two, David asked questions and he said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Number one, David knew that there was something special about him because he was circumcised. David was circumcised. And he knew that this circumcision connected him to a certain ability that the lack of circumcision that Goliath had did not connect him. People of God, I wake up every morning and I attack this land with the contemplation that if Jesus raised from the dead, hallelujah, there is no way me, you, I am not going to succeed in this world, in this generation. You're joking. There is a time when I brought in goods and all my goods were stolen from URA and they delivered to me empty boxes. And I went into URA and I begged, I said, can we look at the cameras? And they refused. And I stood in front of the woman officer and I told her, and I said, madam, I, with tears in my eyes, I said, I am going to prosper in this generation. And I told him, and if it means prospering when you're in that chair, I will still prosper. Why? Because Jesus considered, Jesus got me back what the devil had stolen. The devil, the highest form of stealing that the devil had done was to steal my life, children of God. It was not even money. So if Jesus could cause my life to come back to me eternally, there is no way he's not going to pay me back. I considered the scripture where the disciples told Jesus, and I like to say this in Luganda, you will forgive me. But the disciple told Jesus, he said, you know, he said they had left everything they have. And Jesus said, you will receive in this life everything that you have left and even more. So I knew that God is going to restore me. Listen, children of God, the Bible says that he restores the years that are stolen by every kind of worm. The young locusts, the big locusts, the old locusts, the locusts that are, that are frail, the ones that are weak, the canker worm, call it any name. So you need to get to that place where you contemplate the glory of God. Let me tell you, you need to get to a place where when the scripture says it, eh, you contemplate it and you do it. There is a day I read that Proverbs 31. And the Bible says that she considers a field and buys it. And then I said, hey, I need to start considering. I mean, before you buy, you must consider. You must consider the field. I started to consider. I started to contemplate what God says about acquisition of property. I started to, con because that is what that woman was doing. She would consider. She would lie down in the night and she would say, but Uni's kitchen is small. I will tell you a story. At that time when I read that scripture and it came off the page for me, I was renting on a building in Mokono for Uni's kitchen in Mokono. And that building had the worst customer care for a manager. It had the worst toilets in a dark alley. The toilets would smell, the smell would hit you from a distance. And the thing I hated the most is the thing where a customer would want to go to the washroom. And then when they come to the reception, you tell, you give them a key. You know, we need to consider as believers that there are certain levels that are above us. You know, where you have to give a customer a key, like a small key to go to the, I got, I said no. I then started to consider. And then I would drive through Mukono Town. And Mukono Town is such a small town. Before you start it, you finished the town. And so I started to ask myself, but where does someone buy land in this town? In all honesty, I could not see where you get land. I just couldn't see. And then I started to consider. I said, but God, God owns all land, all silver and gold. The cattle upon a thousand hills. There must be some hills around here. There has to be a place where I put my head. And, 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 there, and I'm above 18. God said he gives me the desires of my heart. And I'm of age. I should be able to own land and lands, you know. And I started to contemplate his glory. I started to contemplate. You see, the glory of God is the part of God that makes God God. So that that, that makes God God is he's a giver and he gives now. You know how the Baganda says that, that if God gives you, 
even a man will give back. Now, those are the things that make God God. And that is his glory. So your face needs to be unveiled. By the way, I met many people in the movement of intercessors for Uganda. I met many. I met many people who had been in this movement for over 17 years at the point that I met them. And there are many whose faces were still unveiled. They prayed prayers. The prayers actually made sense. The prayers prevailed, but they had not come to that place of the burning bush. They had not come to that place where they see God as he truly is. You see, you need to get to that place where you consider that our kingdom is, is the best kingdom to be established on the earth. You see, we are doing the earth a favor to establish the kingdom of God here because it is the kingdom of God that is the answer. The Bible, we always sing that song that says Jesus is the answer for the world today. The kingdom of God is the answer. So when we multiply and subdue, we are doing the earth we are doing the earth a favor. The Bible says that the earth is in birth pangs, hmm? waiting for the manifestation of the true children of God. You need your face to be unveiled to that. You need to contemplate the glory of God. I will tell you another thing that made me to, you know, where I contemplated the glory of God. I started to think about the non-believer and how they actually prosper and how they go on to conquer without power. <laughs> you see, all the non-believers that we see that grow big, the power that they have is not power. It is a, it is, it is, um, <laughs> it is a, 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 a photocopy of the power. It is not the power, and yet it works for them. Now imagine me and you we have the power of God. Let me go quickly to the next thing. You need to be transformed into his image. Unveiled face, contemplate his glory, be transformed into his image. Wow. I keep telling my workers that there are certain things that God cannot do. And therefore, we also cannot do them in our business because God cannot do them. But where do I get that? I get that from the, the, the fact that I have taken time to spend time with the Father until a place of transformation starts to happen. Until your mind starts to think like the mind of God. There are certain things you're not going to do as a believer. You see, David stood in front of Goliath and he said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? You see, the, you will not see God as a living God until you have been transformed into his image. You see, as a human being, without God, you're dead. You are dead. You're moving around, but there is no life in you. Now, you need to get into your life, the dunamis, and when then that life is within you, you start to see. <laughs> Many believers are like that man who said, who said to Jesus that I see men like trees. I see them like trees moving around. They see the economy like a shadow. They see increase like a shadow. They see getting the right worker like a shadow. They see things like men moving around. God sees with clarity. That is why he said, I have a plan. And the plan is to prosper you, not to harm you. He had a plan. I was telling my workers the other day that we need to stop having SOSs in the company. And they all looked at me and they wondered. And I told them, guys, don't think that after Adam and Eve ate the fruit, there was a stampede in heaven and they called a crisis meeting. I told them we are going to stop living by crisis meetings. Because I, I, I have started to see as God, people of God, the plan for Jesus' death and crucifixion had already been set in motion the time that Adam and Eve ate the fruit. By the time they were created, 
Calvary was already in plan. By the time they ate that fruit, Calvary was in plan. By the time they were chased out of the garden, Calvary was in plan. By the anything that happened, there was never a crisis meeting in heaven. When your business happens, there is no crisis meeting. When your business closes, there is no crisis meeting. That is why the Bible says that his eyes move to and fro, looking for someone on whose behalf he will show himself strong because he has already set everything in motion. He has already set everything in motion for today. He has already set everything in motion for this year. He has already set. So you need to start to see as he sees. You need to start considering things as he considers. But above all, you need to be transformed into his image. And what is his image? The Bible says in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. People, you should be transformed into the word itself. Let me tell you a scripture. One time, or oh, a story. One time I'm reading the word of God. And one of the things that I had realized is the nature of God is that he's a God that 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 thinks deeply about things god believers god is not shallow please speak to yourself look at yourself right now and tell yourself that god is not shallow when god considers a scripture it is so rich it is so rich the scripture is god himself and god is not shallow okay god is not shallow. Therefore, you also cannot be superficial. You need to dig very deep when you read the word. I'll tell you my story on this last point. The Bible says that we should experience ever increasing glory. Ever increasing glory. What do we do? Number one, one of the things I learned from the ministry of intercessors, I don't know if all the other people who go there do it, but I learned that I need to have longer seasons of listening to God and getting instructions from God. Because if I go to a place of prayer as a place of business with God, I need to get to a place where I, where I get instruction from God. So for me, when I pray, I have a retreat, a weekly retreat. And part of that retreat, for about two hours, I get into a real business meeting where we talk about my business, Uni's Kitchen. And I never get away from that place of prayer unless God has given me an instruction. I never do. And so actually for me, I usually say my week starts on Thursday because I do my retreat on Thursday. I used to do them Wednesday. I keep changing the days, but right now I do Thursday. I get instruction for the week. And when I do, I actually execute. Now, one time I'm reading the Bible and I read that scripture in Kings where the queen of Sheba visited Solomon. <laughs> and the Bible says that the queen of Sheba looked at the way the servants of Solomon came into him and the way they left. She watched, she watched the cups that were used in the palace. She watched the way Solomon, uh, you know, um, dealt with his servants, the way he looked at the cases in his court. And the Bible says, and there was no spirit left in her. Now, when I read the Bible, I read as many versions and as many languages. And the Luganda version of that scripture says, I, I'm sorry, they are not Luganda. Incidentally, I'm not even in Luganda, but I like to read a vernacular that I can understand and I understand Luganda. And the, the, the Luganda version says, We are not Sulemani, Bikopo, Jawo, Misango. You know, like they talked about everything that Solomon said. Then the scripture says, Naguamomoyo. There was nothing left in her. The, actually, the Bible says, and there was no spirit left in her. And that morning when I read that scripture, I, I said, until I, I get instruction from God, until I experience what God experiences concerning this verse, I'm not leaving the presence. And then the spirit of God started to minister to me. You see, when you read the Bible, 
almost all these things that you do. Just a minute. Um, sorry about that. So when I when I read a verse, I go yes, back sir. up where I started. I start from, I want my face to be unveiled. I want to contemplate the glory. I want to be transformed so that I see as God sees. And then I get into a season of ever increasing glory where I start to reason with God more about that verse than I reasoned with him yesterday. And I remember that day the Lord told me, Eunice, as a child of God in the marketplace, you need to start to contemplate what you buy, how you buy it, how you put your restaurant together, the kind of furniture you buy, the kind of uniforms you give your people, the way you make the recipe. I'm not yet, by the way, I'm not yet where I should be. But the Bible says I experience ever increasing glory. I'm not where I should be. I, I really recognize I'm not yet where I should be. But every single day, I work towards a place where when a man enters in my business space, where a woman gets into my coaching classes, they will look at how I read scripture. They will look at the interpretation. They will look at how I apply it. They will look at the results of my application. They will look at everything that they will do and there will be no spirit left in them. Thank you so much, Brother Samuel. She saw the food that was served at his table. She saw the living quarters for his officials. She saw the organization of his palace staff. She saw the uniforms they wore. She saw the servants that waited on them on the feats and the sacrifices he offered in the temple. It left her breathless and amazed. Wow. Children of God, if you only understood that one verse. Imagine what you could do for your business. The food that was served are the products that you're giving to the customers. You try to make them better every day. The living quarters for his officials means how you pay your workers, where you take them, how you train them, the trainings that you give them and the, the different packs that you add on to them. The organization of his palace staff how organized are your systems? How do people, please Samuel, share it in Luganda. My Jesus, the people of God, until we get to the place where we see him face to face, we are not going to change the marketplace. Imagine the queen saw the table, saw the sitting of the servants, saw the service of the waiters and their apparel. So when we look at how our people are dressed, you see, I work in the catering world. And I, one of the things that I had not yet conceptualized, but now that takes me off, is these see-through T-shirts. You know those T-shirts where when someone puts on a bra, you can see the, where the bra is. And then you, those T-shirts those where things, where those little, little things come off. He looked at their apparel. He looked at the way they offered the sacrifice in the temple. Guys, that is talking about your prayer altar. The way you give as a business, it is going to set you apart. It is those things that are going to cause the devil to be breathless. And when he saw how they went up to the house of the Lord, remember, this is a wicked queen. Eh? There was no more spirit in her. Now I don't I don't get that. No routine no routine way ya yingiranga ko kugenda muye kalu ya mukama. Ne ye wunyanyo na uni kirida na tasigala mumoyo. Now I want to guarantee you that even if you looked at that one scripture and you became that scripture, you will work in the marketplace, you will sprint you will grow, you will multiply, you will occupy, you will subdue in ways that you don't understand. Now, for me, I had to desire to get mountain experiences like Moses because you get into the mountain. The other day, one of the people on this network, I usually go with her to pray and I will finish in about uh, three or so or four minutes. And we were contemplating the issue of Moses in the mountain. The Bible says, 
<laughs> that when Moses went into the mountain, he came back and his face was shining. Now, some of us have not yet gotten into that scripture, so we don't understand it. But let me break it. Let me break down the little, the very little that I got to understand recently. The Bible says that Jesus is the rock of ages. Children of God, it is possible that Moses didn't get into a physical mountain. Moses got into Jesus. And because he got into Jesus, the face of God shone upon his face. You know the scripture in Numbers that says, may the Lord cause his face to shine upon you? We need to get longer seasons alone with God. When we do that, we will be transformed from one image to the next by his glory. And we will start to see God as he really is. And we will get the eyes of God and we'll start to execute like God. The second thing that you need to do, apart from, I dwell so much on that because it's key. What are your faith? Because it is faith that is driving you. What are it? One of the things I learned from the continental leaders and intercessors for Africa, he said that for them, when they got born again, they made them to read the epistles 20 times in one month. And I remember when he said it, I looked at him and I shook his head and I said, all the epistles 20 times in one month. Wow. But one of the things that I enjoyed about him is when he would pray, he would just by nature, naturally, he would be praying the word. But also when you would see how he executes things, he would just be executing the word. When you'd see what he reasons, he would be reasoning by the word. The faith was well watered. I tried it. I could not do 20 times in a month, but I did three times in a month and my faith changed. Consider the parables. That is also another thing that that, that leader said. He said, I have read the, he actually talked about the gospels, but for me, I went parable by parable. Guys, when you read the parables and you read that, you will understand stewardship you will understand that God left you here with something and you probably are that guy that has hidden it. You will understand the power of thanksgiving when your business is increased. You will not be, you will not be pushed around to give because you will have read the parable of, you will have read the story of those guys that were healed and only, nine, and only one came back to say thanks. When you water your faith with the richness of the parables and you get to the detail, the way we go to the detail of the other first scripture, you will work in ways you've never known, but also get into the gospel. What is the gospel going to do for you? The gospels, especially those first four books of the New Testament, is going to explain to you what the kingdom really is it's going to open your eyes to why we must work the way we are working and it will push you into the marketplace in ways that you have never known. The last thing, Isaiah chapter one, verse 19 to 21 says, if you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be deferred by the sword for the mouth of the Lord has spoken willingness and obedience. Children of God, many of us have been at these altars for so long, but we are unwilling or we are disobedient. We are unwilling or we are disobedient. When God says go into all the earth, that doesn't look like one location to me. That doesn't look like selling in one town to me. Does it, that doesn't look like owning one little shop downtown. He said the whole earth. So either you multiply them or you find a way in which you make them cross the borders because he said into the whole earth. So you're either unwilling to go or you're disobedient. You find your side. You know, I usually tell a funny story. One day I came home and I looked at my bed. My bed. I didn't like my bed. You know, those beds that are squeaky, they are broken, the, you know, some beds, the mattress. And I remember looking at God, I, you know, looking at the bed and I pray, I said it out loud. I said, God, I don't know about other people, but me, I'm willing. I want a good bed. And I think I'm obedient. 
I give, I tithe, I help the poor. I, I told God, I said, I am willing. And then the Bible says you'll eat the good of the land. And I asked God, I said, is this the best in this land? The rest is history because I have a better bed. Because for me, I love my sleep. So me, I'm willing to have a good bed. And I am obedient. So if they say the good of the land, I must have the good of the land. Now, children of God, until our faith is watered, that we start to see God as he truly is, that we start to see the promises of God as they truly are, and we get obedient, and we do. Some of us have been in these prayer meetings for so long. We need, the Bible says that he sent them out two by two. Ask yourself, who is my two? Who is the person that I'm going out with? Because some of you actually, you know, the reason why Jesus sent them out two by two is so that when one is weak, the other person helps. The Bible says that two are better than one. They have a better return. You're a believer. You're struggling with business. You can't do coaching. You can't move alongside another person. You can't allow another person to hold you, off, you, to hold you up. You are not willing and you're disobedient. Just that. Because he sent them out to bed. So it also means your face has not been unveiled to that thing. It hasn't. Because for some of you, you need to save. I have an entrepreneur that I worked with three years ago. She would make a lot of money. She couldn't save. I became her too. I gave her my account number or where I put my unit trust funds. And I told her, I want you every week to be able to put aside this amount of money and share with me a receipt. She was putting aside only 80,000 shillings per month. By the end of that year, she had even multiplied it. She had started to put more and she had 4 million shillings. She's a seamstress for the first time. She managed to buy enough, uh, you know, enough uh, whatever's for her, for her shop. She managed to, to buy material. Now she has three locations. Be willing and be obedient. I want to ask for questions. I would go on and on, but maybe another time. Over to you, my sister, Doreen. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. I'm sure all of you are in awe um, of the revelation this morning. Um, Eunice, I want, uh, someone said something in the chat room that um, has triggered a thought in my mind. And the statement was by Rosette, and she said, Lord, I'm willing. Help give me the strength to fulfill your command. And I just wanted to ask you, just before we go to the questions, can you, Eunice, Dr. Eunice, uh, just pray uh, for the participants and all of us for the same unveiling um, that you have experienced, that God may put that on the rest of us this morning, just before we get into the questions, if you're okay with that. Thank you. Oh, God, your word says that your commandments are not burdensome, and I have experienced this. Your commandments actually remove the burden. They break the burden because for me, when I started to move with you, it became lighter. The Bible says that we should give you our burden and that your yoke is easy to carry, that we should give you our yoke. Until I interfaced with that word literally and I gave you my yoke, business was hard. Lord, I am praying that each of these people that is on this network today will get to that place of unveiling, that their faces, that the scales will fall off. I remember how the scales fell off for me in the area of business finance, and I started to see the profit and loss statement even differently from what the accountants see. I started to see the cash flow statement very differently. I started to see my income statements, my investment plans very differently. Lord, I pray that for every believer that is here, that the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit will overshadow them, that you will brood over them like you did over Mary, that you will brood over them like you did in creation. And as you do that, an unveiling will happen. 
For we desire to be driven by our faith as we make considerations of what to buy, how to buy it, how to sell it, what to sell, when to sell it, when to leave one business to go to the next level. Lord, there is a desire. May you meet every willing and obedient heart in this class today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Thank you, Amen. Thank you very, very much. We have been absolutely blessed, and I'm sure everyone has. Um, dear all um, on the call, I would like to first and foremost to ask for an extra five minutes uh, for those who are able to. Um, however, if you're absolutely unable to, we will release you. But I would like to ask for an extra five minutes for us just for us to go through a few of the questions that we have in the chat and also to encourage you to raise your hands if you have a question, a burning question, a question that we can ask the good doctor to help us uh, to answer so that she answers your questions this morning. So the room is open uh, for questions, please. Uh, let us not go back with them. Let us be transformed and ask every detail that can help us in the journey to seeing the way she's saying things and for God to be who he is in his full glory in our lives. So the floor is open uh, for any questions. I'll be looking out for your hands and I ask uh, any of the others that may see their hands to help point them out. The first question that was there uh, to you, doctor, was, how have you dealt with the corrupt systems in this age that frustrate and sometimes kill the zeal to do business the righteous way? Um, please repeat that. I'm sorry, I didn't get that well. Okay. How have you dealt with the corrupt systems in this age that frustrate and sometimes kill the zeal to do business the righteous way? How have I dealt with the corrupt system? If the system is corrupt, number one, we have the incorruptible word of God. <laughs> the corrupt system can only be dealt with, with the, by the incorruptible, and the incorruptible is the word of God. Now, and the word of God can work in many ways. Number one, you've got to see it. You see, the scripture in Proverbs says, um, the, the scripture in Proverbs, when it's talking about the issues of life, it talks about us being able to see the word, hear the word, okay? We've got to be in a place where you can look into the word, then you can hear the word. So number one, what have you heard about corruption in the world as far as the word of God is concerned? What are your faith as far as dealing with corrupt systems is concerned? Using the word. So that you start to see corruption the way God sees corruption. The Bible actually says that, uh, that, that his body did not see corruption, did not see decay. So it means that it is possible for our businesses not to see decay. But how did his body not see decay? So in the same way, I want to encourage you to study how, what the word of God says about the systems of this world. The Bible of God, the Bible, the word of God says that the kingdoms of this world have become the kings of, kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign. So number one, you need to enforce the rulership of Christ. You start by seeing that word, you first enforce it in prayer, okay? You first enforce it in prayer. That is what David did. He said, before he hit Goliath, he said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? You've got to get to that place where you stand on a hill once in a while and you start to ask in the spiritual realm those questions. Now, when you finish to deal with it in the spirit, you now get to the practicals. What does the word of God say? I'll tell you, one time a young man got into our shop when we were struggling financially, and he had a deal for us to cook for, uh, was it 300 people? And he said that they wanted a full cost meal and there were 300 people and we were going to charge about 100,000 shillings per person. That was a whole 30 million shillings that was going to come into our account. We had not seen money of that caliber before. And then the young man, you know, took everything through to the last detail. And when he was done, he came back to me 
with the check and no, without the check, with the LPO. And he said, but before we sign the check, you have to agree to give 50% of this money to me and my colleagues. So I, I, I looked at him and I said, so you want me to serve the guest's food worth 50,000? But then I tell them it was worth 100,000. And he said, yes, you've got to find a way to do it. And I said, I have no other way. I have no other way. And I let that business go. It was very painful. Young man is born again, finds me at church and without shame comes to me and says, hello. Because I remember he said, you're not going to prosper. He said that. But I countered it in my spirit. I didn't tell him openly. I countered it. And I said what the word of God says about me. So you've got to enforce it in the spiritual realm and you've got to enforce it in the physical. And God's word is true. It will come to pass. So how have I been able to go over the corrupt system? I enforce the word both in prayer and outside prayer. Yeah. Amen. Amen. That is true. we we'll go back to God's word. There are a lot of statements in the, in the chat room. I hope you can be able to see how uh, people are very, very appreciative of the message that we have received today. It truly has had an impact. And I hope you'll be able to read uh, most of those. I can't go through all of them. Uh, so we go to um, a statement and a question from Samuel uh, who asks, when will the book on this topic come out? Do you need a two on that journey? Yes, I need a two on that journey. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go, Samuel. You've got your answer. Okay, then the third question was from Fred Barunji. And he says, uh, how have you dealt with the employees getting those who are able to spur on the business? I have, there are so many things that I could share about that have come up for me from the word of God. There are a few of my mentees on this call and they will attest to some of these things. I run a, a, an altar for business people where we pray together every Monday at 4 a.m. And it has been running for the last one year, one and a half years actually. And one of the things we've dealt with a lot is employees. And as we get into the word of God, we have seen certain things come to life. You see, the Bible talks about David, the people that David got to work with them. The Bible talks about, and I will give just one example of something that we prayed about in that altar. And it is something that for me, I've been doing practically. Like I said, first enforce the word in the spiritual and then come out in the physical. The scripture talks about the people that David worked with when he was out in the wilderness, when Saul was looking for him. And many of us as believers, especially when the businesses are young, we are almost in a wilderness. Now the scripture talks about the Gadites. Hmm? My God, someone needs to get that verse quickly, quickly. The Bible says that those Gadites are men who could run both on the plain and run also on the hills. Hmm? Oh, Jesus. That they want their feet. The Bible says that their feet are like the feet of an antelope. Eh? They, they are men, but their feet are like the feet of an antelope. And then the Bible says that their hands, they work both with the left and the right hand. Okay? You see, when you are praying the word, be very specific. Huh? When I read that scripture, I started to believe God for Gadites. And I described the type of Gadites I wanted. I said, Lord, people who can cook at events but can also cook for one person. Eh? People who can serve with the left hand and with the right hand. People who can think and people who can act. I read it and I actualized it. And I have Gadites in my... I have a young man in my business called Paulo. If I started to tell you the story of Paulo, I probably need a session where I feature Paulo and I bring you, he's a young man. He didn't go far in school. He ended in about P3. I have been with him for seven years. He's the guardiest guardite that you could ever find. Paulo is more to me than people who have PhDs. The level of thinking that that young man has, the way he lays down his life for that business, he was formed in the secret place and he was brought to me in the physical. But also, when we do that prayer altar with business people, I also let my staff come in. After the altar at five, 
my staff are in the room and we pray together. In Eunice Kitchen, and I learned this one from the other gentleman, uh, the Canaan Sites gentleman, that pastor. When I went for a meeting of Africa House of Prayer one time, he told us, and I will never, ever forget it. He said at that time, I don't know if now it's still there, but he said at that time that in his business, he had four people that he employs and their job description is prayer. It changed my life. I don't have people who are employed as prayers, but prayer is such a key thing in Unis Kitchen. But for us, we don't pray the prayers far. We have to get real practical instructions from the prayers that we pray. So how have I dealt with employees? I look out based on scripture. And when you stand in front of me, you know how Saul stood in front of Samuel and Samuel saw that this is the king. As a believer, as a faith dressed, blessed, uh, as a faith driven entrepreneur, someone should be able to stand in front of you and you should be able to look at them and you should be able to tell that, mm -mm, this is the person that I need to anoint. You need to get to that place where you have the eye of God. Finally, I have also, when I get my people, I really resource them. Every person in Union's Kitchen will tell you, I came when I knew nothing, now I can do everything. I resource my people. I empower them with what I do. I actually even tell them that the things I have, I want them to have. So last year I started a, a, a savings scheme specifically for them to buy land. And I told them, if I have a house of my own, I must, everybody of you must have a house of your own. Because some of you get gadites and they run away because of the way you are treating them. I told them, if I have a house, you will have a house. This morning we were in the room and we were praying for, the, for those who are single to get married. I am married, I have a good marriage. They all must be married and they must have a good marriage. They must have good children. They must pay fees for their children. The things that I have, I desire for them. So I look in the word and I enforce by the word. Yeah. Wow. Well, I wish, I honestly pray that we could go on forever. Unfortunately, um, we need to bring this to a close. But Eunice, doctor, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for the empowerment that you have given us for, for this great revelation this morning uh, that has touched the depth of our hearts. Um, to those of us who are here, I would like to say that a lot, my greatest takeaway from this is that the doctor says she was on this platform uh, eight years ago when she was absolutely transformed when her mind started thinking. Again, now she has said the same statement that where she learned uh, from the gentleman of Canon Sites was on a platform like this. And the good news for us is that, okay, for me, which I am sure is for all of you, is that I'm in the right place at the right time. If she got that transformation, I will get the transformation because this Occupy series are definitely a divine um, appointment. They're a divine plan of God to get us where we must go. So I thank you, Dr. Eunice, uh, for your time. Thank you for your great words of wisdom. We will have a session in the evening. Forgive me. I hope I'm still clear. We will have a session in the evening. Uh, where we can discuss further and uh, be able to catch up with all the different questions that we may need to, to go through. At this point, I would like to bring this to a close and I would like to ask uh, Auntie Phoebe uh, if you um, can. Excuse me, Doreen. I just have a, a word that I need to give. Allow me to do this, please. Okay, I want to go. ask each one of us that has been in this session, just two parting shots. Please find that one thing that you are going to implement. Be willing and obedient. Find that one thing and actually maybe go back to all the things on this series and in each of them, find one thing and do it. Find one thing and do it. That's one. Two, one of the things that the Lord told me recently, and I didn't want to share this, but the spirit of God has kept on compelling me, so I will. Recently on one of my prayer retreats, uh, the, Lord, the Lord impressed it upon my heart and he said, Eunice, the UPDF has Wazalendo. The teachers have a teacher's circle. St. Francis has the St. Franciscan circle. Watoto has YSEV. And all those circles are meeting needs of specific people. And he asked me, Eunice, what do the business people 
in this nation have. And it's, it's one of those mandates that God has given me that is big. He has not allowed me to overly popularize it. He has given me his reasons, but he has given me an action to share it this morning. A month ago, we started the Christian Business Multipurpose Cooperative. If you are interested, it has so many um, do's and don'ts, but if you're willing and you're interested, please get in touch with me. You can get my number from IFU. They have my number and I will let you know because God wants to use this circle as a vehicle to take the business leaders in this nation and their businesses to the next level. The circle has already taken off, but I, I just have that unction and I needed to say it this morning. Thank you very much, Doreen. Thank you. Thank you, Eunice. Thank you very much. Uh, she has reached out. Please reach out and um, get in touch very urgently. Okay, so I'd like to ask uh, Auntie Phoebe, could you receive the word for us in prayer? and uh, send us off in prayer. Thank you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Let us pray. Father, in the mighty name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for the word you have given us this morning. We receive this word with fear and trembling in our hearts, O Lord our God. And we Pray that we shall do the word as Dr. Eunice has encouraged. God, we ask for Comfortable place where I have been And to Phoebe, I'm not sure whether it was my network or yours, um, but we do receive the prayer. Amen. 